The 20th century swept in on a tide of progress. There were great advances in technology and communications. Popular newspapers and magazines, gramophone recordings, moving pictures seen at bioscopes and early picture houses created a new awareness of what was happening around the world. Transport of all types was at a key stage of evolution. Steam was being surpassed by electricity for public transport systems. The internal combustion engine demonstrated its versatility for private and public vehicles. In America, as in Europe, society was still class-ridden. The well-to-do wanting the middle and working classes to know their place. In the early years of the century, Britain was still building 50% of the world's merchant ships. Her shipbuilding and railway engineering were unsurpassed throughout the world. And her worldwide possessions made the British Empire, the greatest the world had ever seen, seemingly the empire on which the sun would never set. The most lucrative trading route was that with North America, and the North Atlantic became both the major sea route and the most important for passenger trade. At that time, there were no restrictions on emigrants from Europe entering the New World, and many thousands made the crossing. Britain was in competition, chiefly with Germany, to build the biggest, fastest and most luxurious liners and so capture both the well-to-do travellers and the bread-and-butter emigrant trade. By 1906, Germany had both the largest liner, the Kaiserin August Victoria, at 24,581 tonnes, and the fastest liner, the Kaiser Wilhelm II, with a speed of 23.6 knots. Britain outshone them both in 1907 with the Cunard liners Lusitania and Mauritania, both at 32,000 tonnes and speeds of over 26 knots. They were built with subsidies from the Admiralty, who wanted to regain British prestige and prevent Cunard from being taken over by an American combine, the International Mercantile Marine Company, the IMM. The subsidy also meant the two liners could be adapted in time of war as armed merchant cruisers. Already under American financial control was the Oceanic Steam Navigation Company, more popularly known as the White Star Line. Since the early 1890s, White Star had given up its quest to attain the fabled Blue Ribbond, which relied on the expensive and often uncomfortable luxury of high speed. Instead, a policy of comfort and safety was adopted, leaving the quest for speed to the other lines. With the takeover by IMM, cash was readily available for building even larger ships, and the advent of the Mauritania and Lusitania provided the spur for White Star to produce a series of ships that would dazzle the world. The American backing enabled the company to embark on an ambitious plan to produce a trio of liners to provide a weekly Atlantic service. They would be the largest, most luxurious and safest ships in the world, 50% larger than the Cunard giants. They were to be called Olympic, Titanic and Gigantic, the last eventually named Britannic. This is Well Street, Hanley, and this is number 51. It's changed a bit now, but on the 27th of January, 1850, it was the birthplace of Edward John Smith, later captain of the Titanic. Now, I think this is incredible, and I think it's incredible for two reasons. Firstly, because this is Well Street, Hanley, it's not a Liverpool, it's not a Southampton, it's not a, a town with a famous seafaring or maritime tradition. It's a landlocked town, it's about as far away from the sea as you can possibly get. It's a town, not of ships, but of clay and of coal. And I think it's incredible that a potter's son from Well Street Hanley should get it into his head, not just to go to sea, but to become captain of a transatlantic liner. The other remarkable thing about this is a little bit more subtle, but I think just as incredible. 
in those days to be captain of a transatlantic liner was as much a social position as it was a navigational position. In other words, you got to be the captain of a ship such as the Titanic, not simply by being the best navigator or sea captain, but ha by having the social savoir-faire, the nous, if you like, to deal with the international, the transatlantic, rich and famous, the millionaire set who chose to sail not so much on a certain ship, but with a certain captain. There was something about Edward Smith that these people liked. He knew how to deal with them. He knew how to make polite and fascinating conversation on the captain's table. You'd think that someone who had that sort of savoir-faire would come from an aristocratic or at least a certainly very well-to-do background. But as you can see, this is an ordinary terraced house in an ordinary terraced street in Hanley, Stoke-on-Trent. Captain Smith must have been a truly remarkable person to make his way from an ordinary house like this to the bridge of the Titanic. In other words, the transatlantic rich set, the millionaires, chose to sail with Captain Smith. And that's not bad for a lad from Well Street, Hanley. This is Beacon Park in Litchfield. And this is a statue to a great sea captain, Captain Edward John Smith, R.D. R.N.R. He wasn't born in Litchfield. He didn't live in Litchfield. He was born in Hanley, Stoke-on-Trent. This statue was erected in 1914, and the original bronze plaque, which says, Commander Edward John Smith, R.D. R.N.R., born January 27th, 1850, died April 15th, 1912, bequeathing to his countrymen the memory and example of a great heart a brave life and a heroic death. Be British. There's no mention on this original plaque of the ship which is most connected with Captain Smith, the greatest liner of its day, the biggest ship in the world, the ship that was to be his greatest and his final command. That ship was the Titanic. <laughs> The Titanic is remembered in many ways. This mural is in a shopping centre in Hanley, Stoke-on-Trent, the birthplace of Edward John Smith, the captain of the Titanic. We're here at Etruria Methodist Church in Stoke-on-Trent, which used to be called Etruria Wesleyan Church and Schools, uh, because here we have a photograph of Captain Smith. Um, he was for a long time a member of this Sunday school, he came to Sunday school, and he was also uh, a member and worshipper at this church. Uh, the photograph was given, in fact, by the members of the old boys' school, because in addition to being a church and schoolroom, this schoolroom, in fact, served as the day school for the surrounding area. It was the first day school in the area, and therefore, uh, John Smith, as a young boy, would come to this school and would be taught in these rooms. When he worshipped as an adult in the church, of course, it's a church which dated back to 1805, and since that day has been virtually unchanged. As you can see, the church itself is a typical Wesleyan church of the early 19th century, with the gallery going all round and the central pulpit. This has remained intact from its uh, planning and building in 1805 and it would certainly be uh, like this in almost exactness when uh, Captain Smith did in fact worship in this church in the 90s and early years of the present century. Captain Edward John Smith, born Well Street, Hanley, January the 27th, 1850, son of Edward Smith Potter and Catherine Smith. Educated Etruria British School and became steam hammer operator at Etruria Forge. At the age of 21, visited a friend at Liverpool and applied to join the Mercantile Marine. Outstanding career. Captain first ship at age 24. Became commander and commodore of the White Star Line. Premier Atlantic captain. 62 years of age, he was the very type of a British sea captain. Quiet, with shrewd, keen eyes beneath his shaggy brows. 
Strong in command, gentle in social converse, modest as a simple seaman, brave as a lion, of unblemished honour. Though I believe he's an awful stickler for discipline, he's popular with everybody. As vessels increased in size and power, Captain Smith changed from one ship to another and bore the burden of increasing responsibility. He commanded 17 White Star Liners in succession, and he was known and loved all over the world by men and women who travelled with him. His employers had absolute faith in his skill and judgment, and his caution and strength of character, and his unswerving fidelity to duty. When anyone asks me how I can best describe my experience in nearly 40 years at sea, I merely say, uneventful. Of course, there have been winter gales and storms and fog and the like, but in all my experience, I have never been in any accident of any sort worth speaking about. I have seen but one vessel in distress in all my years at sea, a brig, the crew of which was being taken off in a small boat in the charge of my third officer. I never saw a wreck and have never been wrecked, nor was I ever in any predicament that threatened to end in disaster of any sort. You see, I'm not very good material for a story. Well, he seemed very large to me. I don't know whether he was, but he was very upright. And he had a beard. And, oh, he, he looked different from all the other sailors in my eyes, which indeed he was. Yes, he was very nice. Yes. I met him, I should think, about three or four times. I only remember that my father spoke to him several times and, and a couple of times I was with my father. And he took us somewhere. I don't, I'm quite sure it wasn't the bridge. But it took us somewhere which um, was where passengers didn't normally go. But I, of course, wasn't a bit interested at seven years of age. But he was very nice, I remember that, and he greatly admired a doll I had. He was very nice to me. One of the main links here with the Black Country, with the Titanic, and it certainly is a link, are Titanic anchors and anchor chains. They were produced by a company in Netherton called Noah Hingley and Sons Limited. And they originally came about in the 1830s, producing various types of chains for both industrial, commercial and shipping. Then as the company expanded, they went on to doing large scale anchors and anchor chains for ships. And it's hard to believe that a company who has set up 110 miles on the new shoreline could produce some of the largest anchors and largest quantities of anchors ever produced in the world. The company first started making large-scale anchors in around about the 1870s and in the year of 1910 the White Star Line who had had a lot of their anchors made for the company of Harland and Wolf at Belfast. Now in Hingley's supplied those anchors and in October of 1910, the order came through from the White Star Line and Harland and Wolf offices for Noah Hingley's to manufacture the anchor chains, anchors and mooring equipment for the new Olympic class liners, Olympic, Titanic and Britannic. And the first of the orders came through were for Olympic and Titanic. Here are the pages from the 1910 Noah Hingley Hall's anchor book. And these are the original orders for Titanic's uh, side and centre anchors. And each of the, the orders um, show different parts of the anchor that was manufactured, such as the anchor heads and the blocks, the anchor shanks, the gudgeon pins and the plates and the pins. It also includes wages, costs of the usage of machinery, the testing with machinery, and the labour and haulage costs. And with the side anchors, the total price came to £338.00. Eight and six, and the large centre anchor, which is down here, came in at two hundred and sixty-one pounds seven and nine. And it was certainly a hefty price for a hefty anchor. First of all, what was manufactured was the anchors and chains for the Olympic, and the process of making the chains uh, was solely made on site at the Noah Hingley Works. <laughs>
here is the interior of the anchor chain sheds and you can see the chain gang in the process of producing a length of Titanic's anchor chain. Here we can see that the anchor link has been put into its distinctive shape after being put through the mandrel and it is waiting to be joined up to its closed up neighbour. Down here we can actually see the, uh, the link as it's now been completed. Ben Hodgetts is holding on to the link while it's actually sitting on its anvil and the rest of the chain gang are looking on. Around the floor we can see various types of tools and equipment including the lump hammers and the 15 pound jimmy hammer. The process of making each of the anchor links, they were produced in the pig iron factory that was based in, on the Hingley Works site. Each of the bars were then sent down by a barge on the, on the Dudley Canal to the Hingley Works. They were then put into the anchor chain shops and there were a couple of dozen men who actually worked there in the anchor chain shops. Each bar in its straight format were then put into a furnace heated up and then the heated bar is put into a machine known as a mandrill and the mandrill, steam powered, would then turn the bar into the distinctive alval shape that we all know today of an anchor link. But both ends of the anchor link itself were not fused together, this will be done and allowed to process. Once it's been turned into the distinctive shape of a link, it is then reheated, put onto some anvil blocks, and then using anything up to 15 pounds lump hammers, known as jimmy hammers, the anchor chain team would then proceed to hit and strike the link until both ends of the, 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 the link were then fused together. <laughs> While still hot, a central stud is then put into place, hammered in there until it's fused. And then once it's done, a case of side welding is used where the metal is heated again and using chisels and hammers, both ends of the anchor, are there, uh, the anchor chain are then fused together and that creates a link. Then they go on to the next bar and that's put through the same process, it's put through the mandrill, turned into the shape and it's hooked into its near neighbour and then that goes through the process and so on and so on. In total for the Titanic, 1,200 feet of chain was produced. That's just under 100 tonnes in total in weight. The anchor was a much more daunting process. For the sheer scale of Titanic centre anchor, which was the largest of the five anchors that were supplied to Titanic. Titanic, of the kind of ship she was, she was issued with the Hull's painted anchor. She had two side anchors, which one was seven and a half tons in weight, and the other side anchor was eight tons in weight. But the largest anchor was the centre anchor, which sat on a small little well on the tip of the bow's forecastle. You had an anchor that weighed 15 and a half tons. At its time, the largest anchor ever produced in the world. Once the anchor was assembled, uh, what they need to do next was test it and this was according to Lloyd's Proving House and the Lloyd's Register of Shipping who were based in London. Set to a certain amount of tonnage, the anchor would be put into a testing machine that was at the Lloyd's Proving House that sat opposite the Noah Hingley Works. Like the anchor chains who were also tested by Lloyd's Proving House, a certain amount of tonnage was then applied to the anchor. One process that was done with the anchor was to raise the anchor to a height of 12 to 15 feet above the top of a steel cased bed and concrete base. The anchor would be then dropped a number of times onto its edge to see whether the head could withstand being dropped onto such a hard surface such as that to replicate an anchor being dropped at sea for a ship. If there was now uh, imperfections within the anchor from the drop then the anchor head was passed. It was then stamp marked sealed, date of approval will be then stamped into the head, such as the initials of who it was who tested it, the, the Lloyd's Proving House, the Noah Hingley Works, the year and the month. And then it adds a certificate of good for one year until the next head needs to be tested. The anchor shank went through a similar process, however it was put onto its side and then it was hit repeatedly with a lump hammer. 
to produce a ringing sound. If the ringing sound was heard, the anchor shank was passed. If there was a dull thud, there was imperfection. So the anchor shank would then be passed back to Hingley's, reheated, and then it would be then sent back to the Lloyds Proving House and retested that way. After all that was done, it was then stamp marked with number 401, which was Titanic's build yard number, and then the anchor, as a complete assembly, was then painted. Unlike the anchors for Olympic and Britannic, which were, which were manufactured, Titanic's was unique as it was the only anchor that had the Hingley Netherton painted on the shank. This was largely to, due to Noah Hingley's being unpleased, as it was, with White Star Line for not advertising Olympic's anchor fully back in 19, 1910. So Hingley's decided to take it in their own stride and advertise their work with Titanic's anchor. Uh, the transporting of Titanic's anchor was originally going to be in March of 1911, but due to some unforeseen circumstances, there was a slight delay in getting the anchor and the anchor transmoring equipment finished in time to be sent to Harlem the Wolf. So in the end, the, the anchor was actually tested and finally approved and certificated on April the 29th, 1911. The Hingley Works then passed off the job including Lloyd's Proving House. And the job for transporting the anchor was arranged by the Hingley Company, and they were using WA Ree, who were a company based in Greatbridge in the West Midlands. They supplied a 25 ton cart, more professionally known as a dray, which could withstand the, the pressure of such a large anchor. And with the, the dray, they supplied eight uh, types of Clydesdale Shire horse. And these Shire horses were common occurrence on the roads and canals and rivers of Edwardian Britain. Um, so on the day that the anchor was going to leave, which was Sunday the 30th of April 1911, the eight horses had been hooked up and a large crowd of people, after coming away from Sunday service, came down to the Hingley Works just before midday to, to see this huge procession taking place. Uh, once they had actually arrived there, Hingley's knew that the two mile journey from the Lloyd's Proving House to Dudley Railway Station required going up a rather steep hill. So Hingley's decided to attach six of their own horses to the lead procession, which brought up to a total of 14 horses. However, the photographs that were taken by the freelance photographer Edwin Beach from Cradley Heath clearly shows the procession with 20 horses. The reason being is that London and North Western Railways, who are based at Dudley Railway Station brought down six of their horses to help with the procession. And once they got to the Hingley Works, one of the Hingley workers turned around and said, Yale can take those poor specimens back, meaning too that their horses and the WA Re horses could he easily handle the job. And each one of these horses weighed around about one ton each and could pull it easily twice their own body weight. So the London and North Western Railway's horses were then attached to the head of the team once everything was checked and the anchor had been secured down properly there was um, a, a, a toot from a whistle at the, at the Hingley Works opposite to the Lloyd's Proving House and the procession began. The journey of two miles was over cobbled streets and uphill and through Dudley Town Centre and to do this the local authority had to cancel trams that were running and the market had to be pushed to one side so the anchor could easily pass through Netherton and through into Dudley and through the Dudley Marketplace up to Castle Hill where Dudley Railway Station was situated. The streets would have been lined with literally hundreds of people and it was a, a huge event for the townsfolk of both Netherton and Dudley. It was indeed a huge event, nothing like this had happened before.
disaster that befell the Titanic in April 1912 was a night to remember. The event that occurred one year before in May of 1911 when the world's largest anchor for the world's greatest ship was pulled from Noah Hingley Works via 20 shire horses with streets lined with hundreds of townsfolk was for the people of the West Midlands and the black country a day to remember. And a day it was. When the anchor finally got to Belfast it became one of the key ingredients for the building of Titanic and it sat there at Harland the Wolf waiting for the day when Titanic was ready to be launched. The Olympic class ships of which the Titanic was going to be the second was not revolutionary in design nor was it revolutionary in appearance. They were an evolution from previous ships, the Adriatic class, the Oceanic and so on. The revolutionary ships at the time were the Mauritania and the Lusitania. The Titanic and Olympic were developments of their predecessors, the Adriatics, and were an extrapolation of their design into a, a bigger vessel. The Olympic class ships were 50% bigger than the previous larger ships in the world, the Mauritania and the Lusitania, which were revolutionary in design. The Olympic class were purely a development of previous White Star vessels built by Island and Wolf and exceeded their tonnages by almost double. But where the Titanic and Olympic had the upper hand over the Mauritania and Lusitania, they were designed for the American market. Instead of being baronial in their design interiors, they were more luxury hotel. They were absolutely fabulous. The Olympic class in the smoke room especially were particularly finely fitted out, having mahogany panelling with mother of pearl inlays. This is the drawing office, or one of the drawing offices at Harland and Wolf in Belfast. These two, two offices still exist and are a great tourist attraction. You can see the draftsmen working on the long benches with the large pieces of, of paper on which they drew details and sections of the ships. This gentleman here appears to be Mr Chisholm, the chief draftsman, and the little alcoves on each side uh, where foremen would come in from the shipyard to talk about various aspects of the drawings and also the apprentice draftsman would be tucked out of the way of the main office. But very formal, people would wear their jackets and ties in the drawing office and discipline would be very tight. The draftsmen would be very experienced men and would know every aspect of the ship's design. In the later stages of the building of the Olympic class, Thomas Andrews took over from the Honourable Alexander Carlyle as a chief designer and it would be Thomas Andrews as part of the guarantee group who would go on the maiden voyage and sadly lose his life. On July the 1st, 1907, the order for the first two ships was placed with Harland and Wolf of Belfast. They were given the shipyard numbers 400 and 401. Major changes were needed at the Queen's Island shipyard. Three existing slipways were demolished and two new ones laid in their place. These were straddled by a gantry giving clear spaces of a hundred feet between rows of supporting towers. The 840 feet long gantry was surmounted by a mobile crane with a span of 135 feet and lifting capacity three tons. Six mobile frames each carried ten radial cranes with lifts and ramps to transport men and materials to the various levels of construction. A large floating crane was purchased from Germany and the construction of a new dry dock was commenced. The number of employees at the shipyard doubled to 11,300 during the building and fitting out of the two immense liners. The designer of the ships was Thomas Andrews. 
He was the nephew of Lord Pirrie, the chairman of Harland and Wolfe, and was a well-connected member of Irish society. He worked with his deputy, Edward Wilding, using a drawing office full of draftsmen and a huge model of the proposed class of ship. The keel of the Olympic was laid on January the 1st, 1909, and that of the Titanic on March the 16th. The construction of the two massive hulls progressed apace, with the Olympic a few months ahead of the Titanic, to ease pressure on the shipyard production shops. On October the 20th, 1910, the Olympic was launched. She was painted grey to allow press photographers better views of the liner. And the launch took just 62 seconds. She was then towed to the new deep water quay for fitting out, leaving the black painted Titanic still caged in her surrounding gantry. Because of the size of the Olympic class, Special slipways had to be constructed, and Harden and Wolf demolished three existing slipways and built two slipways in their place. These two slipways were covered by a huge gantry, which was uh, produced by the Owl Company, with the, it was called the Owl Gantry. And th this enclosing gantry supported cranes, which could move longitudinally and laterally across the slipways, and could pick up very heavy plates and items. Uh, used during the course of the ship's construction. The shipbuilding methods were the tried and proven methods where they laid blocks along the centre of the slipway and on these blocks they laid plates for the keel and from the keel extending outwards with the bottom plates and on top of the bottom plates they erected what they called floors which were vertical um, frames basically on top of these frames, they built another um, a hull. So, in effect, the floors divided the hull into a cellular dobber bottom, which was uh, watertight. The inner plating, the inner hull, was used as the base for the boilers and the engines. And from these floors extended the, the frames, and these frames would then hold up uh, the plating of the ship's hull. Very traditional um, shipbuilding methods, but very dangerous in its execution. The, the men in the shipyard weren't paid all that much, um, eight shillings to two or three pounds a week. And um, jobs in the yard were highly sought after. So if anybody failed in their job, they were soon replaced with, with other people. Between the laying of the Olympics keel and the the laying of the Titanic's kill, there was a period of about four months, so men could be transferred one from one ship to another. And if extra riveters were required, they were hired from other shipyards within the Belfast area. But all in all, the two ships employed about 4,000 men over a period of the four years of the total construction. A massive investment in the city and um, the source of livelihood for many, many men. And some of the men included in the, in the building were selected by the company to go on the maiden voyage as what they call a guarantee group. And these men would make notes or even rectify any faults with the ship during the course of the maiden voyage. And Thomas Andrews, who was by then the managing director of design, was also on the maiden voyage supervising these men. Another man on the maiden voyage from Harland and Wolf was uh, Mr. Chisholm, and he was the chief draftsman, and one of his responsibilities was the design of the lifeboats. And it's often been said that the Titanic didn't carry enough lifeboats, and this is correct, but she did comply with the current legislation and even exceeded the legislation by a percentage, and legislation dictated that she would carry 16 lifeboats, but she carried four additional what they call collapsible boats, uh, although only two of these were what they called under davits. The other two were stowed on top of the officers' quarters. Uh, Axel Wellen, who designed the davits that would lower the lifeboats in case of emergency, anticipated 
that the ships would eventually catch up with the legislation and carry around about 48 lifeboats. But because of current legislation, White Star and Hardenworth decided to keep within the law and stick with the 16 boats plus the four extras. They said that the lifeboats were unnecessary because the ships were so if watertight and um, unsinkable, as the, the press said, that they would act as their own lifeboats. And if a rescue ship had to come to them, then the lifeboats would be used as small ferries to take passengers from uh, the Olympic or Titanic to any rescue ship. This photograph shows the Titanic under construction. She's being built up as far as sea deck and she's underneath the owl gantry and you can see the overhead beams of the owl gantry here and that's uh, held uh, cranes which move transversely across and longitudinally down uh, through the length of the slipway. You can see tree trunks are being used as sub temporary support columns between the decks. They will be later replaced with um, steel. And just here you can see a group of riveters. You can see the dolly holder underneath here with a long lever dolly which gives him some leverage to hold the rivet up from underneath and two hammer men on top. This photograph must have been uh, taken on the weekend because there aren't uh, any other men around. So the photographer, uh, Mr Walsh, would have come in to the yard at weekends to um, take these uh, series of photographs. The hour gantry here covers both the slipways and supported the, the cranes which would lift and, lo and lower plates into position. In the foreground we've got the uh, plate stockyard where plates ready to be fitted are uh, uh, stored. The Olympic here is almost ready for launching. She's painted white for the occasion uh, because this would show up better for the publicity photographs. Titanic is still under construction in the, on the slip alongside. Here we see the Olympic being launched on the 20th of October 1910, around about eight months before the launch of the Titanic. The Olympic was painted white for the occasion because this showed up better in the press photographs. You can see here the gold band that had been painted round as part of the White Star livery. And then later on, the hull would be painted black. The hull was painted white, more or less at a last minute whim by Lord Perry, the chairman of Harland and Wolf. And it took uh, quite a few men, quite a short time to paint the whole hull. But it was soon to be painted black again. But you can also see the bracing on the rudder here to keep the rudder steady during the launching process. Uh, this particular photograph shows the workforce leaving the shipyard after a day's work. Uh, the Titanic you can actually see still on the um, slipway in the far distance there. By now the Olympic which had been built in the adjacent berth has been launched and the Titanic is approaching launching herself because her hull is now being painted uh, black and um, she's almost ready to go into the water. I became very interested. I had enormous curiosity and persistence. And I watched the Titanic grow in Harlton Woods from the keel up to the top. And I wondered how on earth that huge ship could get into the sea. And my father took me to the launch. He was in charge of the Belfast Telegraph, which is the largest newspaper in Ireland. And the launch turned out to be a beautiful sunny day. I was six years old. And on the 31st, the launch took place. There were crowds and crowds of people around, and all the ships, and the effort of getting this huge ship into the water proved to be very simple. All they did was to knock the chocks away and give it a little push, and in 30 seconds, this huge mountain of iron 
was floating in the sea, free to go anywhere. These new vessels were designed to have a service speed of 21 knots. The engines generated 55,000 horsepower. Cunard had opted for marine turbines to propel their record breakers, but Harland and Wolff adopted their favourite combination, reciprocating engines, to drive the two 23 feet 6 inch diameter outer propellers, the steam from which then exhausted into a low pressure turbine which turned the ahead only 16 feet 6 inch centre propeller. Providing steam for the engines were 24 double and 5 single ended boilers containing 159 furnaces. In the months and weeks approaching their launch there was a great deal of excitement and a great deal of hard work and worry within Harland and Wolff. The slip had to be prepared, the ship itself had to be slightly raised from the building blocks and this was done by driving in wedges and underneath the, the, the space between the ship and the launching ways would be spread tons and tons of wax and oil and soft soap to enable the ship to slide down the slipway. So there's a great deal of hard work, a great deal of worry, and on top of everything else, a great deal of calculation. The calculations to assess the forces during the launch would take a few men, perhaps up to two years, to calculate. No computers in those days, everything was done by hand and by slide rule. And there was a lot of hard work that went into this particular event. And the few seconds, up, up to a minute of the ship's launch, was amongst the most critical seconds of that ship's life. So it's a great deal of work that went into a ship's launching and not many of the thousands who came to the launching would realise the effort that went into this particular momentous occurrence. On the day of the Titanic's launch, on the 31st of May 1911, the Olympic was due to sail for the very first time and she was going to go to Liverpool where she would be open to the public uh, for display uh, with the public paying half a crown a head uh, for admission. And the admission money would go to a local charity, a local hospital. So the men, the people who came into the yard to see the Titanic launched, looked, had a look at the Olympic with all the flags flying before she set sail and then turned their attention to the slipway where the Titanic was ready for launching.
Because the Olympic was the first of the class to be launched, she received a great deal of publicity. The Titanic received rather less publicity, but here in a copy of the Sphere, there are two photographs which show the launch of the Titanic at Belfast. On the left hand side, shortly after she'd entered the water, there were observers standing on the quayside, some of them shipyard workers, uh, as a member of the public in the lower right hand corner wearing his jaunty boater. On the right hand side it shows the Titanic just before her launch. The platform here had been built for the observers who had come to witness the event, the official observers, and that was surrounded by uh, bunting to give a, a bit of colour. On top of the gantry itself, which you can't see in this particular picture, were three flags, the American, the Union flag and the White Star flag and a series of signal flags which spelt out the word success. The working conditions in Harland and Wolf were very austere at that time. There was no health and safety. Men wear ordinary shoes into work, flat caps, and the staging from which they worked was basically wooden poles and wooden boardings. There were several deaths during the building of the Titanic, and there was an actual death during the launching when one of the supporting shores fell over and killed one of the workmen. But the launching itself was a great event in Belfast. Thousands of people lined the shores and came into the shipyard. They were on paddle steamers afloat watch watching the ship being launched. And it was a great celebration in the city. Admission to the shipyard was by ticket only and there was never a launching ceremony as such with the White Star ships. One worker famously said they just build them and chuck them in. Shortly after midday on May the 31st 1911 the Titanic was launched into the River Lagen. Here she is just leaving the slipway. Her stern is in the water and her bow is still on the slipway itself. You get a good idea of the massive construction of their old gantry and there's another ship already under construction on the berth vacated by the Olympic. Men are on board the Titanic here, uh, some of the shipyard workers, um, possibly given special permission to be on board for the launching. Here's the Titanic just after being launched. You can see here what they call the fore poppet, which supported a cradle that uh, actually slid down the slipway when she was being launched. Men are in rowing boats along various parts of the hull ready to release some of this um, launching gear. 
the whole of Ulster was excited. This was the biggest ship in the world. And they're all excited about the launch. And everybody in the country turned up, and all the ships in the harbor. And there's a great crowd at the launching platforms. And three stands were erected round. And I remember the enormous noise. Maroons went off, rockets went off, and uh, signals were given to stand clear. And just as my father said, the chocks were knocked away, and the hydraulic rams gave the gentle push. And I didn't believe it was going to move, and it didn't move for quite a long time. And then I felt suddenly that I was moving backwards. But of course, it was the ship was moving forward. And it went faster and faster, and it was pulling. They had great tons and tons of anchor chain that were attached to the ship, so that when it, it stopped gathering too much speed, and these chains made an enormous row, and they were dragged on, and the ship went into the sea with a tremendous splash, and all the sirens and everybody, and there was great rejoicing. And I felt very proud of this, and proud also that my birthday was the 15th of May, 1905, and this ship's launch was also in May, the 31st of May. So I had a great kinship for that ship. And all round with the little matchstick men and boys that had built her. And I thought to myself, I'm one of those little people. I too could build a big ship. I too could see the world. And that became my driving force. The launching of Olympic and Titanic were at that time the pinnacle of Harland and Wolff's efforts. They were achieving White Star's commercial ambitions and they were proving to the world that they were a force to be reckoned with. This ship would be on the ocean for many, many years. It would carry many, many people, many of them rich, famous, as well as emigrants. So she represented a great deal to many, many people. To the millionaires on board the Titanic, the Titanic represented a right to their wealth, a right to their privileges. But to the immigrants on board, traveling to a new life, she represented this new life, a new hope and a new world. <laughs>